Yes, but that is not all there is to it. Remember this one. When we have a flux that is cutting a wire, a voltage is induced in that wire according to Faraday's law. We remember that. And if there is a current path, that voltage will create a current. And once there is a current, the magnetic field will apply forces to that wire. And with forces, we have torques, and with torques, we have a more. Let's see how we explore this. Consider this scenario. The three stationary coils we've seen before, now in a 3D representation for phase A, phase B in blue, and phase C in yellow. If we apply a set of three phase currents to those three coils, a rotating magnetic field will appear in the center of that setup. But now we bring a setup like this, a cylindrical setup with vertical wires like this one and joined at the top and at the bottom with metallic rings and connected so that it's allowed to rotate around its vertical axis. Let's see what's going to happen with those vertical wires connected by rings at the top and at the bottom. Let's remove the three coils to see more clearly what happens to that structure. The rotating magnetic field created by the three coils Red, blue, and yellow is still there. It's rotating at a velocity of omega radians per second. That field will cut those vertical wires and will induce a voltage, like so according to Faraday's law. But because there is a path for currents, the current will flow and the field will apply a force on those wires. And those forces, given the radius of rotation, will imply a torque and the whole rotor will start to rotate following the magnetic field. Not quite as fast as the field, but fast enough. If it were to rotate at exactly the same speed of the field, there would be no more flux cutting, no more induced voltage, no more current and of course no more torque. So that machine will rotate at a velocity that is slightly less than the velocity of the rotating magnetic field that we've seen before. If you imagine that rotor rotated 90 degrees, it looks indeed like a squirrel cage. That's why that type of rotor is nicknamed a squirrel cage rotor. And the whole motor around that is called a squirrel cage induction motor. Now, in this case, we have about 16 of those wires or bars, slightly skewed to be sure, to avoid some other problems we haven't mentioned. You see those wires and their rings that connect them at the top and at the bottom. Now imagine that instead of 16 wires, we had 50 or 100 or 1000. What about if we had an infinite number of wires, we would have a continuous metallic surface surrounding that drum? Well, this is what I did. I set up a coffee can and put the coffee can in the middle of the three coils. Let me show you. In this experiment, instead of setting up a squirrel cage in the center of the machine, I put a coffee can. Yes, the coffee can works like a squirrel cage with an infinite number of vertical conductors. Three coils strategically located, 120 degrees apart, are fed by a set of three phase currents fed from a busy hydro power outlet. A rotating magnetic field will appear in a moment and that field will induce currents and will apply torques on the coffee can and make it turn about. Observe. It works just the way Tesla predicted it would. The currents produce a rotating magnetic field. The field induces currents in the can and applies forces on those currents. The coffee can rotates. Let's make sure there is nothing else making the coffee can rotate. If we have a peak inside the can, we ascertain there is no hidden mouse happily running around and making the coffee can rotate. There is nothing inside 
and there is no hidden tiny electric motor at the bottom either there is only a spindle a passive spindle what makes the coffee can rotate is the rotating magnetic field created by a set of three phase currents in those three coils and that is all there is to this experiment